How judgmental are you? Like this judgmental baby in the picture? Just judging how you change a diaper. Look at that. Just, just how judgmental are you? I mean, we've all judged, so how judgmental are you? How judgmental? If you rate yourself zero to 10, if your spouse or friend or so-and-so, you know, ranked you, where would you be on the list of how judgmental you are? Well, if you're like me and you live in America in today's culture, uh, this is a very big issue. A lot of non-Christians tell Christians that the problem is you're a bunch of hypocrites and you judge, judge, and it says don't judge, and you still do it anyway. Well, that's a big deal. We hear this all the time. Don't judge, don't judge. So you've been like me, you walked in my shoes, know how I feel. I did a quick Google search and about a trillion results on all the things. Don't judge until, don't judge until. None of those things were biblical, but they all said don't do it. And I'm convinced it's because in a modern American culture, if there is a such thing as sin, we don't say that word because it's very offensive and not popular, but if there were a, a cultural sin, I think the chief one would be intolerance. If you, or to use the word they like, tell me I'm wrong, or use the word it would be judgment. If you want to stop a conversation cold, no matter how it's going, if you ever don't even like the conversation, whatever reason, they're talking about deep dishes better than thin crust, which it clearly is. What would Jesus see? This is not a hard problem. Anyway, if they're just crazy, all you have to say is, I feel like I'm being judged right now. Skadoosh, conversation's over. It is over. It's the cultural equivalent of the N-word. Just say, are you judging me? Boom, it's over. And the reason why is because in American culture, everyone's up in general, of the day, it's moral relativism. Moral relativism says there's no such thing as right and wrong. There's, no, there's just my truth and your truth. That's all there is, right? I can say whatever I want to say about anything ever. As long as the end of it, I say that's my truth. That's it. As long as you say that, you're cool. I mean, not really. Not really, because people will condemn you no matter what you say, but that's the idea. And moral relativism, you can't say you're wrong because there's no such thing as wrong. That's why it prohibits it. You can't say that. Who are you to... You can talk in church. Who are you to judge? Who to say I'm wrong? Don't you know the rules of relativism? You're not above us. We're all in this together. There's no such thing as right and wrong. Now, logically, that's absolute gibberish nonsense. Because my next question to the person is going to be, and it has been, so is it wrong to judge or is it right to judge? What's wrong to do it? Okay, there's such thing as right and wrong then. Moral relativism is nonsense. But biblically, it's also wrong. There is such a thing as right and wrong. There is such a thing as right and wrong. This is not, in Christianity, it's a no-brainer. But if you're not a Christian, it's not a no-brainer. They bought into this idea that it's all relative. It's just my truth and your truth, and that's all that matters. Now, again, logically, that's silly nonsense, and biblically, it sure is. But if you're like a normal person like I am on the streets at Walmart, whatever, we're around this all the time. We're always around this idea that you're not supposed to judge people. Don't tell them you're wrong. You can't do that. And if you do, there's something wrong with you. Well, Huh. Are you judgmental? Here's some signs you might be judgmental. It's probable. It's like this judgmental baby. Here's some signs. So stick with me for a second. If you think you're superior, you're probably judgmental. Some of you in this room, I've met some of you, so some of you might struggle with this problem. Some of you have narcissistic tendencies. You really do genuinely look down on people. You think you're better. You think you're smarter, more clever, more handsome, pretty, whatever. You just genuinely think you're better. People who have narcissist or narcissist or narcissistic tendencies have a hard time following the leader. They have to be the boss. They have to be in control. They're always they're anti-authoritarian because they're convinced everyone's worse than they are. They're convinced they're superior. And so if you kind of walk in the room and just you have a general disposition of, I assume if you're talking, you're wrong because I didn't give you my opinion yet. That's usually you're probably judgmental. If you think you're superior to other people, if you think that way, maybe, you know, maybe no one in here is, but maybe. Don't point people to Bennett, okay? Uh, you expect people to be good consistently, right? That one time they offended you or hurt your feelings or they did something wrong. They really did something wrong. Not just hurt your feelings, but they sinned. And you just can't get over it. Remember that time last year? Remember three Christmases ago? You had that person at home? Oh, don't you remember Thanksgiving? That was 1972. Some of you, anyway, let go of it. You might struggle with judgmental attitude if you struggle with people have got to be good all the time. If you struggle getting past a person's flaws, they're not a human being. They're just the flaws you see in them. 
Maybe they bite their fingernails. Maybe they tap their foot all the time like some of you were doing or stroke your hair. Or maybe you, they just, you can't, oh, this bothers me. You can't see past a flaw. You might struggle being a judgmental person. Uh, you usually assume the worst motivations. I mean, everybody knows this, right? They're, maybe we have incomplete data and our little switch is they're a villain. I'm not sure. Or they probably meant something well. Normal, healthy people give people the benefit of the doubt. So the not, they're supposed to go to the right that says, Maybe I'm uncertain. Maybe I don't know all the facts. Maybe they meant well. Judgmental people don't do that. There's always go to the left. There's just always, no, I tell you what she meant. Oh, I know what he did. I know what it is. You don't give the person the benefit of the doubt. You're probably a judgmental person. If that's you, if you tend to assume the worst. Uh, you tend to split people. That is to say, in psychology, you see only good or only bad. And you can't tolerate one or the other. You're probably judgmental. If you're general, just suspicious, you kind of go, uh, you have that baby's face all the time when you meet a person. Now, trust should be earned. But the point is, in general, if you assume they're somehow villainous, you're probably judgmental. If you have a, what's called a critical parent in transactional analysis, a critical parent or inner critic in your mind often, you're probably judgmental. A critical parent, you'll know, I hear this all the time when people talk about themselves. They'll say, um, they might call me, whatever y'all, did people call me, Pastor Dave, Dr. Pendergrass Dave. Uh, I know this is stupid, but like, well, they're already judging before it comes out. You, you see yourself in the mirror in the morning and you already say bad things about yourself. If you make a mistake, if you, if you, if you trip over something, you don't go, ow, oh, that happened. You say, I'm so clumsy, right? Critical parent inside your mind is always running all the time. That's a very common problem with people. If you have this inner critic in your mind all the time about how bad you are, or dumb you are, or stupid, or whatever, the odds are you're probably judging on other people. Because that voice is so loud, you see other people like that. And everyone should be condemned if you get condemned. That's a real struggle. So here's some of the signs you might be or probably are judgmental. Why are we judgmental? Why are Christians, why are human beings judgmental? For a lot of reasons, I'm going to explore a few to them. And we're going to go somewhere, we're going to Jesus. Believe me, we're all going to Jesus because Jesus talks about some of this. Why are we judgmental? For several reasons. Usually it's an issue of safety. It makes you feel safe because you avoid your own faults. Psychology, we call this denial. I just can't go there. I can't admit that I am wrong. And so we just avoid it. If I'm condemning you, my finger's so far out here, boy, no one can focus on me. I just, I'm, you're all just bad sinners. It makes me feel safe. Also makes me feel safe because we're afraid of being hurt. Many of us, if, if, if you're young, maybe it hasn't happened yet. When you get older, at some point, you will be hurt by another person. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be betrayed. You're going to get a wound because of that. And a lot of people don't process the wounds they own they stay with it all the time and so what happens is instead of coping instead of processing that they have an unhealthy coping mechanism which is to stay apart from other people to say distant because i don't be hurt again and one of the ways i can not be hurt again is by condemning you so if i can judge you pretty quickly i'll keep you at a distance and that way i don't have to get close to you which means i won't get hurt again it's no way to live, but many, many people live that way. And that's one way people can judge is that it keeps me feel, I feel safe and cozy on the inside. If I can judge you as bad or a villain, I don't have to get close. I don't get close to anybody. I can just come to church, judge the sermon, judge the music, and I can run out as quick as I can so no one can get close to me. Some do it to feel superior because it makes you have a, a sense of self-righteous worth which is false nonsense, but that's how we feel on this side, right? We're not the center. Good for me. I'm so glad I'm good and they're bad. Whew. All right, you find value on that. I'm so glad I'm not nearly as bad as blank. Whew. I'm, a, I'm so glad I'm good. It's not that you just think you're good. And when the, this is the case, it's that you think you're better. And that makes us feel safe and warm and fuzzy, some of us. A lot of times we judge people because it fits a stereotype. And there's all kinds of studies that prove this. They've done many, many studies. Humans tend to find beautiful people, people you think are pretty, you find them instinctively more trustworthy and thus more valuable. You find people that you think work too hard, like women who wear too much makeup and too much hair done, too much whatever, you instinctively think they're hiding something and therefore not trustworthy. And so you'll be quickly to judge people you think are trying too hard. I met a woman one time, I worked at a, a does, and she was a secretary and real sweet, older lady, real sweet. And she's real thin and had some uh, doctor's helper augment parts. And she, and I said um, one day something about being thin. And I said something along the lines of, 
uh, I don't want to, I'm how I said something. I said, have you always been this thin or something? Or so I'm making, I was chit chat before the, she was a secretary to the big dog coming out. And she goes, yeah, I'm some skinny, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I bet women give you a hard time. She goes, oh, yes. And she right away, she goes, yes, they do. She goes, I had a woman tell me, she goes, I don't trust anybody that skinny. Why would you go out of your, I don't get, anyway, that's a stereotype, right? I don't trust you. That's, it fits the psychology that, that many, many, many people do that. Sometimes we stereotype races. We stereotype political parties. We like to put them in a mold, and then we're easy to condemn them because our mind's made up. The stereotype should be condemned. Other times we're doing something in psychology called projecting, and that's when you have a problem with inside of yourself, and you don't own it. You can't own it for various emotional reasons. And so what you do is you project that onto someone else. They're not really having the problem. You are, but you can't handle it. It's very common in marriages. I'm convinced he's cheating on me. Well, he's not cheating on me at all, but you're cheating on him, but she can't own that, so she puts it on him. He really struggles with pride. And is he just a pride? He's just prideful. He's not prideful at all. You are. You're the arrogant punk. You just don't own it. She's, she's sneaky. No, you're sneaky. That's called projection. That's projection. Let me ask you a question. This, you know, just, just raise your hand. Have you ever judged anybody ever? Yeah, good. The rest of you are judging everybody else. So that's what happens when we judge. We've all done it. We're not all judgmental people all the time. No, that's not true. Everyone's not judgmental as a constant adjective. And that's what I'm getting. That's the whole point here is, but we've all judged people. And I'm trying to reflect on why it is we judge and why we do it. They're all, we can list more reasons. These are some of the most common reasons. Now, now in the Bible, to judge means something very particular. Now, in American English, judge means to give an opinion about some. So if a judge in a courtroom a judge says, I, you know, they, they make the judgment, it means innocence or guilt. It just means give an opinion. And the Bible, however, to judge usually means one thing, to condemn. Or to say it this way, to declare a person deserving God's punishment, either right now in this life or even worse still in eternal life, which means is it's like saying a person says God is going to send you to hell. You're going to hell. I, de- I declare you as worthy of hell. That is to say God is going to condemn you. General, generally speaking, in the Bible, that's what the word, as it's translated both in Hebrew and Greek, to judge means that. To condemn a behavior, to give a person to hell. Let's hear what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 about judgment. Now, remember, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking about all kinds of things. We're gonna, I'm going to give the context. You're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. If you have it, you say amen. Okay, there's Bibles back by the lamps right there. Bible apps, for a look at those, okay? Be sure, Matthew 7, verse 1. Jesus says, do not judge. in Greek, do not judge. Do not judge uh, unless you're judged. Let us, let you not be judged. Don't judge that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce sinner, right? You will be judged. And the measure or the measuring stick, the ruler you give with the ruler the measure you get. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? How is that possible? How can you say to your brother, hey, let me stick that speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? Stop there. How is that possible, Jesus says? How is that even possible? Hey, Tim, can you come here for a second? Can you come here for a second? You weren't listening, so you get, I'm kidding. Just come here. I'm just messing there. When whoever steps on the carpet has to preach next week. So I didn't want you to know that I said, I should have said that first. I need to hold that for us. So here's your speck. Here's your speck, Tim. And you, you don't have to step in your own eye, but it's eye. So this is what Jesus is picturing. Tim, how can you let all that wood be in your eye, man? Show the crowd over there. Talk about how big that speck is compared to mine. What is wrong with you, sinner? Who would ever let that kind of wood come out of a person's life? Listen, Tim, you need to get right with God. You need to get right with God and get, give it, come on, you need to get right with God. This is the picture Jesus has in mind. Thank you so much. I'm do, I, well done, Tim. Well done. I'm going to give you a raise. This is what Jesus has in mind. When Jesus says in Matthew 7, 1, 2, and 3, oh, where'd my clicker go? I'll put it up here. Judging Tim already, I'm just kidding. Jesus says, disciples don't condemn disciples by a standard they don't apply to themselves. God's going to do that. You ever heard, it's like the black, remember that? Have you heard that? It's like the black, the kettle calling the, 
Yeah, that thing, black. <laughs> Jesus, how can you do that? How can disciples walk around going out of the way to say, look at the speck in that sinner's eye? How can you do that? Jesus' point is, don't do that. Don't do that. He says in verse 1, do not judge, do not condemn, lest it be given to you. The idea, of course, is that if I'm, if I'm going around judging people by the big speck, this big fat two by four in my eye, if I'm acting like there's no two by four in my eye, and I'm going out of my way to make sure I judge you because of speck in your eye, I am being what Jesus calls here in a second, a hypocrite. The only kind of person who exists who's able to say, I don't have anything in my eye at all, ever, of course, is God. And that's why God's going to use that standard on you and me. And that's the idea that Jesus has in mind. This perfect standard of what is wrong with you people? And that's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be funny. It, it is, and it's supposed to be. That's the Jesus can be funny. That's the whole point of that. You and I simply are not in a position to be out the business looking for specks when we have stuff in our eye. Now, that's because God is very much unlike us in this area. Now, let's reflect very briefly on that. This is worth pausing on for a second. God is the only, the only, only being who has the moral capacity, the moral authority, he's perfectly moral, and the office of God, and the knowledge to be the proper judge. He's it. He's it. God's the only one who says, get that speck out. I ain't got nothing in mine. He's right. He has nothing in his eye ever, no matter. He's on the perfect store, a perfect moral authority. He's in the office of God. That's like office of parent, office of mayor, office of what, a boss. He's in the office of God. Even non-Christians, even non-Christian pagans, will, heathens will say, will say uh, any non-Christian will say, or Jew, will say, uh, stop playing God. Who are you, God? Who died and made you God? Even non-Christians understand there's still the office of su- absolute superior. And only God has perfect, complete knowledge. This is one of the things, one of the reasons why it's so important for us to remember. It's, it's easier for us to stop looking for specks, instead looking at what's coming out of our own lives, out of our own hearts and minds, right? Our own hearts and minds. It's easier to look at what we're doing when we realize we're not God. Only God has nothing at all. Now, if we forget that, we will look at people's behaviors, we will look at what they do out in the world or at home, and we'll just look, that, that behavior was wrong. Well, that behavior might have been wrong. But you don't know, listen, you don't know how hard they, it was for them to make that choice. Or the vice versa. What they did was good. Well, we did the same thing. Yeah, but with the reason why they did it, it was very good had you known their past. Look, I've never been an alcoholic. I've, I've never had alcohol in my life. I haven't. For various reasons. So when I pass by a bar here in Kiwani, I don't feel the urge. My mouth doesn't salivate. I don't feel the old times. I'm not reminded of old memories. I'm not, I'm just, I have no memories. It's not a struggle for me. So praise God, I have my own struggles. That's not one of them. So I drive by a bar and I go, if someone put out an inventory and said, David versus blank, who was an alcoholic, and we both pass by the bar and they go, they both did a good thing, I guess, because neither one of them went and got drunk. Drinking itself isn't a sin, but getting drunk, of course, is. They say, well, neither one, oh, great. Well, David did a good thing. He did a good thing. But the, the guy who was an alcoholic did a much better thing because of the moral character inside, the raw material that got him to that place. Vice versa, if I do something wrong, but it's not nearly as bad as it could have been. God sees that. He doesn't just see the driving by the bar. He sees all of our raw material on the inside and what we do with it. You and I don't know that. We're so busy judging outward appearance. So what? He drove by the bar. Does it make a difference at all if you knew that person had been struggling for 28 years with alcoholism? Doesn't it make a difference if you knew the struggle? The struggle's real. C.S. Lewis says it, as usual, perfectly. He says it like this. Human beings judge one another by their external actions. God judges them by their moral choices. When a man who has been perverted from his youth and taught that cruelty is the right thing does some tiny little kindness 
or refrains from some cruelty he might have committed, and thereby perhaps risk being sneered at by his companions, he may in God's eyes be doing more than you and I would do if he gave up a life itself for a friend. Look, that small kind of actus might be a phenomenal good to God because they know how, where he comes from. And the opposite is true, which is to say, put it the other way around. Some of us who seem quite nice people, in fact, may have made so little use of a good heredity, uh, heredity and good upbringing that we're really worse than those whom we might regard as fiends. That's why Christians are told not to judge. We see only the results which a man's choices make out of his raw material. But God does not judge him on the raw material, but what he has done with it. What he has done with all of our upbringing and all the stuff we've gone through and all our psychology, he sees what we do with that because he's God. Now, this is, I, would, I, just, I love Lewis. I would say Lewis, C.S. Clive, he called him Jack was his nickname. I'd say Jack, if you let me call him that. Uh, Professor Lewis, that's one of the reasons Christians are told not to judge. That's not the reason, but it is one of the reasons why. We're, in, we're just not in a place to judge people accurately. We're just not. We're just not in a place ever, ever, ever to be in a place to do it accurately. Then Jesus says something. Look what he says in verse 8. Look what he says in verse 8. I mean, verse 5. I'm sorry. Verse 5. See, I don't my glasses on. I look like an 8. I'm getting so old. Verse 5. Verse 5, you what? You hypocrite. Remember, hypocrite is the Greek word for actor. A hypocrites is a person who wore a mask. They look like something on the outside, but on the inside they were very different. Jesus is saying it's like that. On the outside, while we're projecting, looking for spec digging and spec, spec, spec police, it might look like we admit we're all righteous. On the inside, if we could really see ourselves clearly, we got a big fat two by four. Jesus says, you hypocrite, first, first, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Then do that. So disciples are not supposed to judge by a standard we don't give to ourselves. We do condemn disciples. We do judge disciples by a standard we do apply to ourselves. We're supposed to help sisters and brothers in Christ. When a non-Christian says, you Christians aren't supposed to judge, uh, there's a lot of things I say about that. One is, well, kind of. <laughs> it says, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, that we're not supposed to judge outsiders. That's true. That is true. I don't go to a non-Christian and go, you should know what Jesus taught. No, they don't. I don't judge that behavior or them. Amongst disciples, then I would say, Jesus says we're not supposed to judge disciples by a standard we don't apply to ourselves. That's true. So I don't go out of my way saying, oh, here's the problem with all you problems. And I got my own problem myself. No, don't do that. But once I've taken that log out of my own eye, let me, let me stop the metaphor for a second. Once I have repented of my sin, then I'm supposed to go help a sister and brother in Christ repent of their sin. I'm supposed to help them. You and I are supposed to help them. Jesus says this explicitly. I could go on verse after verse. I'll start in uh, chapter 18, rather, 15 to 17. Jesus says, and you can read this in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Jesus says, if you find someone in sin, go tell your brother one-on-one. -on -one. If he doesn't listen, you find another person who knew there was sin. If he still doesn't repent because he doesn't care about sinning, then you're supposed to go to the whole church community and say, man, this guy's still sinning. He won't do anything about it. Jesus says, if that's true, and he still doesn't listen to the whole church community, you're supposed to treat this person, as he says, as a tax collector or Gentile. That means you go kill him and all, you don't make fun of him. The point is, he's not a disciple of Jesus. He's not a Christian. This person needs the gospel. They don't need to be help them get the speck out of their eye. They need Jesus. They're not even a Christian. That's the point. What about Galatians chapter 6? At the end of verse five, uh, chapter 5, in the beginning of verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, If you have the, the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will come out of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Does it ring a bell, right? And then he says, those of you that have the spirit should go to your brother in the spirit of gentleness to help him if he's caught in some sin. Gentleness, to come to him and say, hey, I want to help me. He says, to help carry the burden that's too much for them. He says, because we all got our car, go to bury, to, to carry. Some people feel overwhelmed. We go there and help them. What about 1 Corinthians 5? The apostle Paul is addressing the whole church of Corinth. They know about a guy who's sleeping with his, his mother-in-law. 
And he says, not only is that happening, the church is approving it. Kick his rear end out of the church. And the rear end's in the Greek, not really. Kick him out of the church, he says, hand him over to Satan in the hopes that he will repent. These are just some of the verses. So it is all through the New Testament that disciples are supposed to help other disciples once they've gotten the two by four out. And I'm telling you, if you've never experienced this by a person who really understands this, you're missing out on life. I'm telling you, people people who used to struggle with alcoholism are some of the most gracious, kind, loving, forgiving, truth-telling people you'll meet to a person who is struggling with alcoholism. They don't show up to an alcoholic and go, you dirty, wretched sinner. You're, oh, brother, he's instant. I get it. The struggle is real. You do need to stop, and you know that. How can I come alongside and help you? How can I be a safe place for you to fall? The person who used to be addicted to X, Y, Z, and you struggle with this, and that, boy, I used to gossip all the time, and man, I need to, boy, I can come around and help you, brother or sister, because, boy, I gave up to Jesus a lot, and, you know, sometimes I struggle with it too. We can help each other. Disciples do condemn that behavior, as Paul says, in the spirit of gentleness, Galatians 6. That's what disciples are supposed to do. The best way to do this, really, if you're a disciple of Jesus, is to ask at least one other trusted friend to do it, to help you out. My, my best male accountability partner, his name is Jeff, lives in Houston. Uh, I told him years ago, I said, Jeff, uh, I'm open to that. I want that help. If I've got some sin I just can't see, I've got stuff sticking on my eyeball, proverbially speaking, and I can't notice it, I need you to point it out. Please help me. I need the help. That's it. Now, I've never told my wife that, but she helps me every day. No matter what I, I say, stop helping me. She still keeps pointing out. I'm just kidding. I was a joke. She's, she's here. I can say that. I'm kidding. Just a joke. Go to verse 6. And we're, and we're almost done. Jesus says this in verse 6. It's kind of an odd expression here, but let's, let's go to verse 6. Do you have it? Amen. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before swine or pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What an image. Giving these things that are valuable. See, pigs, obviously, they'll try to eat it, and they don't. it's not food, so they'll trample on it. Same thing with dogs who try to bite you. Now, the Greek word for pearl is margarita. So that's the whole point is don't throw your margaritas for pigs in a, on hog day. That's the whole point of the sermon. That will be the only thing you people will remember Remember that sermon you talked about margarita? No, I didn't. The sermon was not about margaritas. That happens all the time. Don't give the dogs what is holy. What does Jesus have in mind here? Well, we're not exactly sure what he had in mind, but Matthew puts it in this context probably on purpose. His point seems to be you don't give over what you, it's valuable, the pearl, which is basically the judgment on the sin. Since pigs don't like to wear that stuff, that is to say, certain people will not at all accept your help to repent of the sin. They don't want it. They don't like it. They don't want it. They don't want it. You gently, graciously, lovingly say, brother, sister, man, I used to struggle with that thing a lot, and now I see it in you. Can I come alongside and help you? No, no. There's nothing wrong. Look, as a Christian, we might disagree that the behavior is a sin, fine, let's go to Scripture. Let's go to Scripture and see if it's a sin. No problem there. But a Christian will want to discover if it is a sin. A Christian will not go, I don't care. That's not a Christian. Christians do care if it's a sin. Listen, why do I care about that? Because I've been, Jesus died for my sins. I mean, that stuff is behind me. I'm not going back to that nonsense. Woo, I'm not going back there. So if a disciple Jesus comes and talks to me and says, man, did you know that that was a sin? I go, no, is it really? I didn't know that. I want to stop now. But someone goes, I don't care. Forget you. Sometimes they're like pigs or dogs. They'll come and attack you because you're trying to help. Those people we give away, Jesus says, don't throw those pearl for those swine because they're going to trample on it. And it seems to be the case, and I'm not sure, but most interpreters lean this direction in my view too, is that it seems to be the case that Jesus is saying, use discernment, use discernment. Not all disciples want to, not all people want to hear it. And like in Matthew 18, if they don't want to hear it at all, you're supposed to bring another second person. If they still don't want to hear it, you go to the community. If they still don't want to hear it. You're not trying to walk around, make them get it. That's not the goal of a Christian. 
So the, the pendulum seems to be, for most Christians, is never say a word ever because we're told not to judge. That's because they misunderstand Jesus' teaching, as I just talked about. Jesus never said, don't judge, and he went home. He says, don't judge by a standard you don't apply to yourself. First take out, that's the extreme is never, ever do it, and Christians keep to their own self. The other pendulum is where the sin police. And we go out of our way to make sure everyone knows that they're a dirty, rotten sinner all the time. Both are wrong. Both are wrong. Jesus says, get the thing out of your eye first, repent of your own stuff, then you can help other people. That's exactly what Jesus says. So here are some tips. One is, if you are a judgmental person, I would ask God to help you reveal your own heart. Are you a judgmental person? If you are, if you struggle with that, acknowledge it. Acknowledge it, confess it, decide to stop doing it. And a third one is figure out why. You don't have to figure out why, but it sure will help you. I know that from experience and also from counseling. It will help you. Some of you are judgmental because your mom or dad was judgmental. You heard people say gossip and horrible things like commercials or she shouldn't be wearing that and he just this and you just learned it. Well, whatever it is, sometimes it's easier to stop doing something when we figure out where it came from. That's all. Sometimes to figure out how the fire, we can put a fire out, whether it's our lit, we can get put it out, but it can help us to figure out how the fire got started so it doesn't happen again. So if you struggle with that, acknowledge it, decide to stop and, and, and then if possible, figure out where it came from and, and why. Then ask God to help you stop trying to be him. Right? It's God's prerogative. It's God's prerogative to make sure God is the only one sinless. So if we spend our energy walking around looking at everybody, they're all beneath me. They all should be condemned. Oh, man, I would say let that be God's job because he's perfect at it and you're not and I'm not either. Oh, my goodness. We can leave all that nonsense, all that. It is, for us, it is nonsense. But behavior, nope, that's not how we roll. God can, do, God can do it just right. His judgment will be perfect. Once you've repented of your own sin, then you can help someone repent of theirs. Once you've done it, then you can help. If you've not confessed and repented of your own sin, you have no business opening your mouth about someone else's struggle with that same struggle. You have no business. These people shouldn't be doing that. And you do it yourself, it's better to close your mouth. You're not ready yet to say that. First, get your own house in order by the grace of the Lord Jesus, then you can help a brother or sister. Then you can help. Help, not condemn, but help. And then if a disciple refuses to receive it, you just remember the God. Just, God, here you go. I'll pray for that person. But you're not, uh-uh, uh-uh, staying up late at night, chasing them down, Facebook, Instagram, mess. you're still sinning. I see it, right? No, not the sin police. Let Just give them over to God. You pray for them, help. Nope. If you refuse to see it, make sure your own business is taken care of. And after you've tried, lovingly, gently, give them over to God and say, here you go, God, I'll just, if there's ever a chance you can use me in their life, use me. If not, I pray for them to hopefully see, see the light one day. Does that make sense? Sermon is not about margarita. Come on now. Just, just let it go. I'm kidding. But let me say a prayer for us. Lord Jesus, help us. Ooh, help us not be judgmental people at all judgmental of course assuming by that i mean walking around and looking down on other people by a standard we don't even apply to ourselves instead lord jesus please help us get any sin that we know is in our life out help us confess it to you help us repent of it please help us stop sinning whatever it might be then lord jesus help us gently lovingly humbly in relationships help other people when they need the help Help them come out of that pit as well and to stop it. Lord Jesus, help us not out all be the sin police, but certainly care about loving our neighbors so much and our disciple friends and brothers so much that we don't want to see them struggle in the sin as well. Lord Jesus, this morning, if there's a heart and mind this morning who is struggling a lot with being judgmental, looking down on people often, Lord, help them acknowledge that, confess it, and let it go. Let it go. Instead, transform our hearts to be like yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.